anabolic steroids are known to cause a range of infections itself from minor to moderate to very severe infections. And even men that inject testosterone for TRT can experience this as well. However, most of those injection infections from testosterone are quite mild and they're usually picked up early because there's um, a doctor involved. So I want this to be harm reduction for you guys together. Today, I put together a really great presentation. I have a lot to present, so I want to stay super strict here. And right off the bat, I want to thank Dr. George Toliotos. He did a great, great job with a chapter in William Llewellyn's Anabolics. This is the 11th edition. He talked about steroid abscesses and infections. So of course I read that, Dr. T, and um, we all work together in the world. Myself, Dr. T, and other great healthcare providers. So thank you so much for allowing me and trusting me, everyone, to listen to this very important information that I put together. So the range of infections from testosterone injections, obviously intermuscular, sub subcutaneous as well, all the way through to anabolic steroids. From local skin infections called cellulitis to deep intermuscular infections called abscesses in the muscle, all the way through systemic inflammation, even sepsis, where I've taking care of so many men in the world, it's not funny, that have come to me after being hospitalized. So the key here, guys, is going to be early understanding and diagnosis and possibly having antibiotics, obviously, on hand and being ready to treat the early infection. So right off the bat, is it an infection versus a local reaction? Because so much and so many times men will do injections and I don't care if it's the deltoid, if it's the vastus lateralis, the glute, even other parts of the body, it just goes away, right? So it just goes away. So what's going on here? So is it an infection versus a local reaction? So here, let me explain this to you. So the local reaction is really a histamine, kind of a mass cell um, response from the agent itself, even with the oil esters, to aqueous based, and of course that benzyl alcohol component. So the component that you're injecting, you're breaking the skin. So if it's sub Q or IM, it's the body reacts to it. Sometimes it's just a local reaction. A lot of times it's not an infection, but it's something very swollen and it is thought to be an infection, but it's a hematoma. It's, it's almost impossible for even me as an experienced physician after 20 years to diagnose and differentiate a local reaction hematoma. Because if you have a lot, if you, if you just hit some, some arteries, small arteries, uh, medium-sized small arteries in the leg, for example, or the glute, and they bleed, more commonly the leg, right, in the deltoid, the glute's gonna be different, but it has its own inherent problems. So, it, with because you have deep bleeding, it's going to fill up space occupying mass and there's going to be pain, even some redness. So many times, it's not an infection, it's just a local reaction. It's amazing. So, you don't really always know what to do. And I'm being honest about this. The best physicians in the world, can they over treat it and then you're being exposed to unnecessary antibiotics. This is why I really love putting this one together for you guys. So what do most guys do? What do most people do in the beginning? Most of it resolves. I mean, so many steroid users will just, they have this commonly, it just resolves. You know, they just take a break on the area, maybe some ice, some NSAIDs, Motrin to leave, and just give it time. Hopefully they stay away from that site and it resolves because you have a good immune system. So, but, Let's talk about the infection warnings. This is really what this video is here. So is it an infection? Is it a progressive infection? What are the signs and symptoms? Okay, here we go. So obviously it's very painful. 
it's painful in the area, it's painful to move. When If you have an injection site here, you just flex back, oh man, it is tender. But that can just be a local hematoma. It's not resolving, you see, it's not resolving. So it's been now maybe a week or more, it's not resolving, and at a certain point, after days to maybe a week or so, don't wait too long, guys, don't wait too long. That's the number one culprit just blowing it off and waiting too long. Some men get scared and they just stay away from caregivers. So if it's getting hotter, if it's getting tender, obviously if you're getting a fever, malaise, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, this is gonna be a sign that it's possibly an infection. It could be a top infection called cellulitis, guys, which is on the skin, it runs on the skin, and of course, it can be deep in the muscle, that's the abscess. And it can be in between, and it can be both. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of anabolic antigenic steroid infections. These are illicit drugs. They're underground steroids, both oil-based and aqueous-based. They can be contaminated with all sorts of bacteria as it's made in a non-sterile environment. Guys, this is exactly why the anabolic doc is here to serve, trying to bring attention to this, and hopefully this world will move forward progressively, and with harm reduction, steroid users won't have to go to the streets and get stuff that's made from horrible environments. Let's talk about the actual pathophysiology of the injection types. There's two type, in my opinion, two types of injection issues, non-sterile technique versus sterile technique. First off, the non-sterile technique is going to be common, sharing equipment, sharing needles to draw with other people, and then the injection needle itself. Don't ever share a bottle, guys. A lot of guys will share a bottle and they'll just use a draw needle and they'll just share or injection needle and they just think it's okay because they're not putting the needle into themselves. They're, they're just using a draw needle to share or they're just sharing that one bottle. It's not recommended, guys. I know the resources are tight. You know, with needles, especially after COVID, it was hard to get needles because of all the vaccines and everything. So the next thing is gonna be reusing your own draw needle and or in, injection needles. See, there's draw needles and then there's in injection needles. Anyone who's watching this that takes steroids or even testosterone, you know what I'm talking about here. So I think that's very common. I've seen this by good guys. They just reuse some of their own draw needles. They really try to keep things tight, but it can just get contaminated. So, and it's amazing that some guys will try to sterilize their own gear, their own equipment with boiling and heating. Even I've had guys buy autoclaving equipment. Absolutely amazing. Now the next in the techniques with the pathophysiology is the sterile technique. Now there's a guy in the app, the anabolicdocapp.com. Daryl, this is for you. It's, it's amazing that in the world, Daryl brought up something that I wasn't able to verify this, that using alcohol to clean the site, which is done by any healthcare provider for sub-Q, for intermuscular, from in, in injections to vaccines to just regular shots of B12, that that possibly could be an issue and that you may not have to do that and that could make actual things worse like MRSA and things. Daryl, what an amazing question and I just don't know. So if you, but let's go back to the sterile technique. Now this is gonna be a sterile technique, but it's non-sterile contaminated steroids. Classic, the sites. What do we have? Deltoids, we have the leg, vastus lateralis, even the medialis in different parts of the leg, top of the rectus femoris, gluteal injections, other in site injections. And I think a big mistake is that the guys don't rotate, but a lot of steroid users know this. It's just inherent in the streets. They rotate. And then another issue is it falls under the sterile technique. It's sterile technique, but there's an issue. And then it's the amount of steroid or gear 
that's injected. And a lot of guys will inject more than a mil, even three mils at a time. When you're injecting that much, you can imagine that if it's contaminated, it's going to overwhelm your system, your immune system that naturally could probably take care of that. So try to keep the amount of injection down to a down low. And so much of this information comes from you, you guys. Thank you so much, guys, for years of being a doctor. 20 years ago where I didn't know any of this stuff, I was just taking some of my own light steroids and I was kind of like a church mouse. And then you guys came to me and I just learned. So this is the stuff that's cumulative, that comes from you guys in the world. I'm giving it right back out there for the new guys. And the last part of this part of the presentation is repeating the injection into a region that's infected. It's amazing that guys will just do that or they'll go from one side of the glute and they'll hit the other side and then you can get a, a bilateral infection. It's, it happens all the time. Now let's move on to the, the bacteria pathophysiology. This is crucial. This comes from me for you guys to really understand this. So what is the bacteria that's out there? So staph, staphylococcus. And again, this stuff is on the skin. This is flora on your skin. Not to mention potentially contaminated in the gear and the agent itself. And of course, with staph, you have MRSA, methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. This stuff is in hospitals. It's out. It's in the playing fields with athletes. So staph, number, number one. Number two, streptococcus. That's the flesh eating. This is like, this is flesh eating bacteria stuff you guys hear about with that red line that runs. It's no joke. And I've seen all this stuff in the hospital when I was a physician working in the hospital years and years ago. And guys get infected when they don't deal with this early or just is bad luck. Uh, and this is the stuff that will get you. Next is Pseudomonas. A lot of guys know the staph and the strep, but they don't know Pseudomonas. This is where you'll see case reports of contaminated steroids. Here's where it's contaminated, for an example, in aqueous space like Winstraw and other aqueous space drugs and not to mention oil-based esters, Pseudomonas likes to be in water. It's aqueous. It likes it, but it, I'm, I'm assuming it likes to be in oil too, but m probably more with the water-based. If there's any infectious disease experts watching this, give comments. Please give comments. Any hospital doctors and surgeons, anyone that knows this, any of you guys who really know this, the real bro science guys, you guys are super smart. Uh, let's Let's get some comments here. So again, the pseudomonas has been isolated in different severe infections. It comes from feces, sewage, and soil. You see, so if your stuff is made in a non-sterile environment, the underground illicit gear, there's gonna be a problem right there. Last but not least is atypical mycobacteria. That's another type of bacteria. Let's talk about the infectious process itself. It's multifactorial, guys. It starts local, it, it can be a top cellulitis, that's an infection in the, in the cellulite of, of, the, of just the, the fat that's right underneath the skin, a skin infection. It could be your own flora, it could be your own flora because you're breaking the skin. It also can be deep and pushed down into the muscle. It could also be secondary to the contaminated uh, gear itself, which is what we're talking about here. So when it gets deep, it's called an abscess, and that's gonna be deep. It could be a, a subcutaneous abscess deep to the skin, and then of course the dangerous ones are when it's an abscess into the muscle itself and it's growing and you're, you haven't hit it. You haven't hit it with antibiotic, it hasn't been drained, it hasn't been cared for. That's why I'm doing this, guys. I'm bringing awareness to this. So when it's deep, it's gonna be a problem. What happens? It's amazing that someone's inherent immune system with just giving it a break will take care of it because your immune system can deal with fighting bacteria. But if you overwhelm it with a big injection, you're doing it over and over, or if the type of bacteria is really pathogenic, that's where the stuff gets bad. Obviously, and if you're a sick person, and if you, if you have, if you, maybe you're fighting cancer, or maybe you're, you're on other medicines or you have diabetes, this is gonna be a problem, you see this? Now, let's talk about the antibiotic spectrum regimen, broad spectrum antibiotics right here. 
This is the, the learning part. This is the healing and what I want to give you guys from love and from harm reduction. I want you guys to understand these are the antibiotics. This is the actionable part here. First off, we go with penicillins. There's penicillin V. No one uses this stuff, of course, guys, but maybe in some remote parts of the world, you have oral penicillin, penicillin V versus old school penicillin G, which is intermuscular or even IV. Next is cephalosporins, Keflex. That's the classic one that everyone's using early for just basic cellulitis, skin infections, Keflex. You guys want to write this stuff down because you want to work with caregivers. You want to just have some of this stuff on supply. Next, running on these penicillin, these beta-lactams, amino penicillin, amoxicillin, broad spectrum, and augmentin. That's amoxicillin with clavulinic acid. I love augmentin for myself, actually, because I've had infections. I always have some stuff. It's very rare, but just get a bad, just get a bad uh, in testosterone injection, certainly not contaminated, but the skin you're pushing through so you get, um, you can get prone to that. Some people can get prone to it in different regions. You know, guys tell me, Doc, I can't do deltoids because I'm prone to getting cellulitis infections. That could be the same for here in the leg. And certainly that glute is complicated back there as far as I'm concerned. So Augmentin, Keflex, these are great drugs. Now, if you have an allergy, this is where you need to understand your history. Get on the anabolicdocapp.com. Take my h &P. It's a virtual h &P. So you can understand everything about your healthcare system virtually and digitally. If you have a penicillin allergy, penicillins are obviously going to be a potential problem. Cephalosporins like Keflex and even amino penicillins like amoxicillin and augmentin. Bleeding it out for you guys here. Giving all this information to you guys. Next, back trim. This is a great drug, especially for cellulitis and even for early abscesses. Try methoprim sulfa methoxazole. This is a very, very powerful broad spectrum oral antibiotic concerning it's a sulfa drug. You hear that? So if you have sulfa allergy, you can't use it. This has definitely great effectiveness against MRSA. These are the talking points. Next, doxycycline. This is another broad spectrum oral antibiotic. Great, great drug for skin infections. It, it, it falls under the tetracycline class. Very powerful against MRSA as well. But you want to understand tetracycline class. If you're allergic to tetracyclines, again, it's off limit. So. To review this crucial point here in this part of the video, Keflex is great, have it on hand. Augmentin is great, I think it's great. Amoxicillin too. Bactrim Doxy, have it on hand. This is really crucial. I think it's not brought up. Not many healthcare providers realize this, but I think it's getting attention. Fluoroquinolones. This is a very powerful class of antibiotic. Ciprofloxin, Leviquin, Avalox. This is very powerful. This stuff will eradicate almost any infection, broad spectrum, no question about it. The warning, it can rupture tendons. Classic black box warning, Achilles tendon. I see pec tendons, distal bicep tendon ruptures. You guys, we're, we're, we're weightlifters, we're lifters. Using this drug is a warning. Fluoroquinolones, if a doctor gives you one of these Ciprofloc, uh, Avalox, Leviquin, be very careful. If it's life-threatening, if it's all you have, you have to take it. But it's not the great drug initial of choice. I gave you those ones right before. In summary, I want you guys to understand what's going on here. First off, contaminated gear and agents in medicine. You gotta get pharmaceutical grade. This is where the world is moving to harm reduction. I pray, I pray it's happening because you look at all the damage it's happening from not just the cardiac disease and psychiatric and shutting down men and infertility and you know gynecomastia and acne, but right here, how many people suffer? Millions of millions of people suffer because they're getting contaminated steroids. This should be a movement for people. Number two, never share or reuse needles 
even a draw needle, guys. If you're if you have one bottle and you're sharing the bottle amongst your friends and you're piercing that over and over, I understand you guys are super smart and you have the one bottle and everyone has their own pure sanitary sterilized needle piercing it. But where does the bottle go when you leave? Does someone use it and do they put something back in it? You see, it's just not a good practice, you know, and you never share needles. That's in the beginning years ago when I saw steroid users had risks for hepatitis B, C, and HIV. I was like, where is this coming from? Share needles. It's just like sharing needles and doing heroin. So that's number two. Number three, keep the injections to the smallest dose. I think if you're injecting big, like three cc's or even greater than one cc, I know myself when I've injected a little bit more back in the day when I was doing steroids, it hurt. And I was thinking, man, if this stuff is contaminated, for the amount of contaminated bacteria, where's that curve where my own immune system is not going to be able to fight it? You see, I, I just don't know, you know? You, you got to be careful. So small doses, and th maybe that's more why guys do microdosing. And guys, taking half a mil every five days is really microdosing. You know, do you go smaller and bring it down to every day, every other day, twice a week? Not that we're splitting hairs, but again, but taking two cc's or three or more every week or two weeks, depending on where you do it, it doesn't even matter. That's going to be a potential problem for infections. And again, you guys told me this. This is common sense stuff. Use sterile technique. I just think using, you know what sterile technique is. You can, you can understand that. Use it. And rotate sites rotate sites. Last and not least, you wait to the end of the video, have your antibiotics on hand early. If you don't have a doctor, you have to understand your allergies. I don't like the fluoroquinolones. If you don't have a doctor, get on the app and learn what your allergies are. The app is not prescribing medicines yet, but I have a dream one day that it will. It's got to be regulated, obviously. It has to be appropriate because I'm a medical license, but it's all harm reduction. So guys, let's get some great comments here. So many of you have had small repeat infections. So many of you have had severe infections requiring hospitalization. Thank you so much. I really hope this helps. I really hope I nail this for you guys. I always want to be super concise so you guys can really take notes and just get something out of this that's great. So it really helps as many men as possible. Thank you so much.